tonight on Connecticut's news station, homelessness is on the rise across our state. We'll hear from advocates about potential solutions to the growing problem. A man is arrested after a deadly crash in Connecticut. We'll have the new developments six months after a boy and his grandfather were killed while driving to hockey practice. Plus, the FBI is joining the investigation into a cyber attack on several hospitals and clinics across the state. We'll have the latest on what's being done to fix the impacts. Now at 10, this is Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. We start tonight on the Weather Watch as the chance for rain moves out of Connecticut. Good evening, I'm Sarah Sanchez. And I'm Brent Harden. Thanks for joining us. We are expecting a dry weekend, and that's a victory. Yay. Uh, we're also tracking the chance for more rain on Monday. Let's check in with Chief Meteorologist Rachel Frank for a first look at the forecast. Rachel, today's potential for storms really didn't pan out. No, we saw much. a couple hit or miss showers. The clouds looked really ominous all day long. And you know what? I was kind of happy to be wrong for once because, because we didn't need the heavier downpours out there. We do have a couple of showers that are still moving through the state and there is the potential for a thunderstorm to move into Fairfield County here over time, but it's going to take some time before it gets here. It's moving to the southeast at about 30 miles per hour. So we'll wait and see what happens as it gets closer closer to us, it could always start to diminish, but it would take until about 1040 to reach Greenwich. Meantime, it's just a few light showers. We can handle this from Cornwall down through Goshen, down in Warren, Kent and New Fairfield. Just a few light showers and we'll have to see what this little line of showers and storms does because it could end up providing some localized flash flooding in parts of lower Fairfield County if it doesn't move a little bit farther south. So we'll be watching that closely. Overall, though, must much of the state rather is going to end up staying dry overnight other than a hit or miss shower or rumble of thunder overnight lows in the 60s. The humidity will be on the way out of here slowly as we head through the day tomorrow. Tomorrow looks like a really beautiful day. We're looking at high temperatures climbing into the lower to middle 80s, pleasant conditions, dry, and we're going to do it all over again for the second half of the weekend on Sunday before. Yeah, more chances for showers return on Monday. We'll talk about it. Your full forecast coming up in just a bit. All right, Rachel, thank you. Well, new at 10 tonight, more and more people here in Connecticut are experiencing homelessness. Yeah, that's according to a report that says for the second year in a row, homelessness is increasing in our state. Yeah, Fox 61's Gabby Molina talked to advocates about the report. She joins us in studio now with more on what they say is behind this increase. Gabby. Brent and Sarah, advocates say there are several factors, but lingering effects of the pandemic and increasing rents are among some of the biggest reasons why homelessness is increasing. On a single night in January, 3,015 people in Connecticut were without a home, a nearly 3% increase from the previous year, marking two years in a row that the amount of people experiencing homelessness has gone up. We're seeing more people than ever um, just just not have the resources to sustain. The Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness says the point in time count is a federally mandated annual survey of how many people are experiencing homelessness in one night at the beginning of the year. CEO Sarah Fox says it's typically a much lower count than what the reality is. Historically, our numbers are always higher um, annually and just daily than what's reflected in the point in time count. The count is not reflective of the need or what we're seeing in our communities. She points to a few different reasons why the increase is happening. One being the end of pandemic relief, another being a lack of affordable housing. Housing is a huge issue here in Connecticut. The lack of affordable housing um, is, it's the case, all across the state in every single community. According to a new report from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, those making minimum wage in Connecticut would have to work 69 hours a week to afford a one bedroom apartment. You can understand how close people are to that edge of not being able to make the rent and then falling behind and then the eviction goes through and then people lose their apartment and are couch surfing or staying in shelters or sleeping in their cars. Luke Milanakos Harrison with the Connecticut Tenants Union says the increase in homelessness does not come as a surprise to advocates. When shelters are full, when folks can't double up with family, uh, when those financial margins are just too narrow, uh, unfortunately some people end up unsheltered outside, which should outrage all of us. Advocates say reaching solutions will take a unified effort. We are a better, stronger state if people and families are housed in every community across the state. 
The Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness is also calling for more funding to address the problem. Right now, the CEO says one of their biggest concerns is the winter that's coming up because they don't have the resources to be able to respond. In the studio, Gabby Molina, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. All right, thank you, Gabby. New at 10, police arrest a Connecticut man who was wanted in a crash that killed a boy and his grandfather. The two were driving to hockey practice. The sheriff in Polk County, Florida, says 24-year-old Glenn Reagan will be extradited back here to Connecticut. Investigators say Reagan drove into the opposite lane to pass a box truck on Route 44 in Winchester. He crashed into an oncoming car. This happened back on January 31st. 16-year-old Marcus Rogers and his grandpa, William O'Leary, died in that crash. Also new at 10, a New Haven man will spend 80 years in prison for a murder and robbery on a Woodbridge playground two years ago. A jury convicted 29-year-old Ricky Trainum of killing 33-year-old Rondell Atkinson back in July of 2021. Investigators say 24-year-old Jordan Rudell went to the park with Atkinson before his belongings were stolen and he was shot. A jogger found Atkinson's body the next day and Trainum was found days later with Atkinson's car. A teen is charged in connection to a deadly stabbing that happened outside an East Haven school. Police say they arrested a 15-year-old who's accused of stabbing 15-year-old Dustin uh, Saracelli on the grounds of Tuttle Elementary School on May 23rd. The suspect's name has not been released due to his age. Police say in a statement they hope the arrest is the beginning of the healing process for Dylan's family. Security at Tweed New Haven Airport found a loaded gun inside a man's backpack yesterday. That man, who is from South Carolina, told police he was in a rush and forgot to put the gun in his checked luggage. Guns are allowed on planes, but must be in checked bags, unloaded, and packed separately from ammunition in a locked hardback case. Guns must also be declared at the airline check-in counter. This was the eighth gun found at a Connecticut airport this year. An appellate court upholds the Connecticut law that eliminates religious exemption for school vaccine requirements. A lawsuit was filed against the state by We the Patriots USA Incorporated back in 2021. Connecticut law requires students receive certain immunizations before enrolling in school. Prior to 2021, students could apply for medical or religious exemptions for that requirement. Attorney General William Tong released a statement on the ruling today saying in part, quote, this decision is a full and resounding affirmation of the constitutionality and legality of Connecticut's vaccine requirements. Vaccines save lives. This is a fact beyond dispute, end quote. Mourners said a final farewell today to a Stanford pastor who was hit and killed by a police cruiser. A funeral for 69-year-old Reverend Tommy Jackson took place at Union Baptist Church today. Jackson was walking back across the street after getting his mail on July 26th when Stanford police officer Zachary Lockwood hit him with his cruiser. Lockwood was responding to another unrelated crash at the time. He is currently on paid administrative leave. Colt Park in Hartford is getting some major upgrades. Officials say the park will get $1 million and that will go towards restoring the Colt Gardener's cottage and carriage house and integrating the buildings into the Coltsville National Historical Park. Mayor Luke Bronin says it's important to preserve the community's history. These structures, like so many other historic structures in our city, around our state and around the country, uh, have not gotten the investment they need to preserve and protect that history. Until now, the 260-acre site was home to Samuel Colt's industrial enterprise in the 1800s. It contained manufacturing armories along with community amenities like social hall and a library. Well, one Connecticut senator is calling for a multi-billion dollar federal investment to solve what they're calling a child care crisis. Senator Richard Blumenthal is asking the Biden administration to invest $16 billion to help child care providers cover costs and, reta and retain staff, uh, something they've had trouble doing after emergency COVID-19 funding ended. Continuing at the present funding level is a recipe for disaster and catastrophe in child care right now. Senator Blumenthal is also urging the president to help pass two bills that would provide even more funding for child care over the next 10 years and cap costs for families in need at $10 per day. Well, happening tonight, a big Mega Millions drawing. The jackpot is now up to about $1.35 billion. There have been 30 straight drawings since the last time someone won the game's jackpot on April 18th. You have a 1 in 302 million chance 
of matching all five numbers and the mega ball. But don't let that discourage you, you know? <laughs> In about 45 minutes, you can quickly flip over to our sister station, the CW20, to see the Mega Millions drawing live. It's happening at 1059. We'll also have the winning numbers right here on the Fox 61 News at 11.